the instructions, yes. Right. So, do you feel happy enough with that? I'll get you a chair. This is lovely. Can have a seat? Have you been getting many people to these sessions? Well, yesterday, sadly, had to be cancelled. Oh, no. Yes, because um, the lady was coming in. So that one, when's the next one? It's, it's tomorrow. What time is that? Uh, at 2 o'clock. Hello, dear. Yes. Nice to see you. Very good to see you. Good to see you. Sorry. I'm just putting him in the picture. Mm -hmm. what Can I get you a glass of water? Yes, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it's being recorded, so if you do everything from here, then the voice and will, 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 all, will all be recorded. So That's people, can, people can join us from, okay. from That's elsewhere. That's great. Um, That's nice, yes, because I was speaking to Margaret last night, because of course she's been poor. Yeah. And um, she said she'd started to watch the Saturday one, yeah. but she hadn't got very far, so I think it interrupted us. But um, it's, a, it's really nice that it takes into the people. Just got a drink of water. Thank yes. you very much. We had a lovely day on Saturday. Yesterday was cancer. Yeah, so the next one is tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow is the Western March, the Mark Penrith and the March. Is it? to speak sitting down. No thanks, I'll, I'll stand yeah. Are yeah. you happy with this chair? This is my house. I'll seem to take any questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we'll okay. do, do an ask at the end. Yes, yes. 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 So, are you going to introduce me? I will. We, we will start at, we'll give till two o'clock, and I'm just seeing how the sound is. 
Yeah, can everyone hear that reasonably well? Yeah, we decided to go down into the, into the pews. It's, it is a barn of a place, but the loop system for folks who are using the hearing aid doesn't actually operate in the chancel. So we found on Saturday's talk, although we were closer to the screen, uh, those depending on the loop system couldn't actually hear what was going on. So um, more room to spread out, but uh, we'll keep as far forward. We'll give five minutes because there's uh, inevitably a few who are just arriving and just arriving as we speak. Yeah. Oh, talk amongst yourselves, that's fine. <laughs> but know that we are now live as well. <laughs> so hello, live stream. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Good afternoon, everybody. It's lovely to see folks. It's lovely to see people from ac across the community. And I welcome if you're a visitor to Penrith and have just landed here entirely by mistake and thought that looks like a splendid way to spend an afternoon. So welcome to the second of our Celebrating Our History talks. Uh, as you will have picked up yesterday's talk by Marion Barter, who is the architect who's just um, published the statement of significance at the architecture of the building. Marion was traveling up from Preston and just decided this is revolting and I'm, I, don't, I don't need to do that. But Marion has sent us the slides of her talk, which we can upload, but she's also said she'll come back and do a talk, uh, particularly about the architecture of, of the building of St Andrews. So we look forward to that. Uh, but today it's a real pleasure to welcome Michael, Professor Michael Mullet. Um, uh, Sue Tomlinson sends her apologies, Professor Mullet, um, and she sent me a note of the things it would be good to say. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so anything I now say is entirely down to Sue Tomlinson, uh, and, and I've no doubt is absolutely accurate. Um, but welcome to any who are able to join us on the live stream as well, or perhaps if you're catching up later. Uh, Sue speaks particularly about Michael being involved in history talks with the grammar school, of course, Sue history at Queen Elizabeth Grammar School, uh, often on his main subject of the European Reformation. Um, so that's uh, no doubt another series of talks for another, another time, Michael, but of course this building, uh, its whole history is right at the centre of that too. Um, many will be aware of Michael's many publications, including what Sue describes as, I think, your retirement project. Um, one suspects it's a significant project. Uh, not one, but six. Uh, a New History of Penrith by Professor Michael Mullet. The Prehistory, Book One, to the Close of the Middle Ages. So we, we, know, we're, we know we're in the perspective of the long term here. Uh, Penrith Under the Tudors, Book Two. History of Penrith. Penrith in the Stuart century, 1603 to 1714, book three. As if that wasn't anywhere near enough, just wetting your, wetting your appetite. Uh, book four, Penrith in the 18th century, 1714 to 1800. Book five, Penrith in the 19th century, chapters on the Victorian town of Penrith. Uh, and book six, Penrith in the 20th century. Uh, we're obviously welcoming Professor Mullet with a vast uh, experience of research into the story and the history uh, of this our town. Uh, and just a reminder that we are in or approaching, depending on when you started measuring it, the tercentenary of this Georgian building, 1722 to 1723. Uh, I suspect uh, Professor Mullet will be able to speak with some authority about that as well as to when we might consider the actual date. But we wanted to have a series of talks celebrating the story of Penrith, celebrating the history of St Andrews, uh, in order to that we might understand our place in the community of Penrith uh, and so serve the community well as we look to the future of the life of this church uh, in the town of Penrith. Um, so, Michael, thank you for making time to be with us this afternoon. Uh, would you please, in the traditional way, put your hands together to welcome Professor Emeritus, I understand. Professor Michael Mullis. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. thank you so much for that very kind, very kind introduction, and thanks uh, to, uh, to my friend Sue for that wonderful blurb. Uh, thank you all very much for coming out um, this afternoon on this rather sultry afternoon. Uh, the vicar said, you know, I'm Professor Emeritus, and uh, don't be scared of the title. It scares me a bit sometimes, Emeritus. Um, but the Latin always helps us out. The Latin always helps us out. And it, it's emeritus. Um, well, meritus, uh, merited, deserved, best, I suppose, meritus. And A is the, the Latin for out of. So it just means best out of it. 
Um, well, today's talk, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is focused on the, this event, uh, it's, to the, its centenary. It's the centenary of this lovely, uh, of the lovely church. Uh, it's the, the rebuilding of the church in 1722. But before we do that, before we look at the rebuilding of the church in 1722, I think we need to put the rebuilding in the context uh, of the longer term story of, of this wonderful church. Uh, and that's why Kath Thompson and I agreed that we would give this title this afternoon, A Millennium of St. Andrews. In fact, it's more than a millennium, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's more, more than a, just a thousand year uh, timetable, and that will not do justice uh, to the sheer antiquity of this uh, institution, because it's dateable. There's been a church here, certainly, from the first millennium of the Christian era or the post-Roman era, uh, if you like. And of course, we have that intriguing, the, those intriguing stone structures in the churchyard known uh, traditionally as the giant's grave and the giant's um, thumb. And they belong to the first millennium. I can't date them any more precisely than that. They are dark age uh, uh, confections. Uh, but we should see them ladies and gentlemen, we should see them uh, as part of a great effort, a great teaching effort, a great didactic effort to reconcile A, Christian faith, uh, with, uh, with B, Germanic or Teutonic uh, art and culture, if you like Anglo-Saxon uh, art uh, and culture. So that if we were to, to turn from sculpture uh, to the field of literature, we could, we could uh, compare those wonderful sculptures to a beautiful Anglo-Saxon um, uh, poem known as the Vision of the Cross, or alternatively, the Dream of the Rood, the traditional term of it, the Dream of the Rood. Today, Anglo-Saxon scholars seem to prefer the term the Vision of the Cross. And in this wonderful poem, this wonderful Anglo-Saxon poem, Christ is um, represented as a kind of victorious warrior. Yeah? The, vision of the, the Vision of the Cross, the Dream of the rude. So over there, uh, there's the giant's uh, tomb, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And, and then in the corner near, um, uh, near the main uh, door, we have another um, figure. We have a, a figure of the crucifixion. It's very eroded. It's very difficult to decipher it, but the great historian W.G. Collingwood was able to decipher the image uh, on this uh, figure. And it's an image of the crucified savior, yeah? Um, and it has a portrait of two Anglo-Saxon gods, uh, the sun and the moon, Sol e Luna. So it, it is in fact a, a, a fusion of Germanic culture and Christian uh, uh, faith with Christ seen, as I say, as a victorious warrior. Those images, ladies and gentlemen, the, particularly that crucifixion image there in the corner of the Churchyard. I think we should see them as teaching instruments. I'm a teacher, and I think we should see those figures as teaching aids, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And they would enable, you see, even before the church was built, they're kind of teaching crosses. So even before the church itself uh, was built, these would be teaching instruments. These would be didactic instruments. And um, missionary preachers would use them uh, to talk to take their audiences, uh, they were teaching crosses, and they would be used pro tem while more permanent churches were being built, yeah, as outdoor teaching auditoria, uh, ladies and gentlemen, while more lasting churches were being built. So we can imagine then the missionary priest taking his, uh, his congregation, taking his audience through the drama of the, of the crucifixion and explaining and using the, the, the sculpture itself as a, as, as, a, as, a teaching, as a teaching aid. And we should also, what we should also do, I think, is as well as putting these things in a cultural context, in a Christian history context, we should also, also put them in a regional uh, context and look at other examples of this genre. So where will we find them? Where will we find the other? Um, well, we'll find them dotted around the county. We'll find them in Aspatria, uh, in West uh, Cumberland. We'll find uh, another example at Bekermit, again in West uh, Cumberland. Bekermit, I found the other day, means, simply means the hermit's beck, the hermit's 
stream. We'll find another example of this genre at Bucastle, which is up in the north, as you know. And uh, perhaps the best known one is at Gosforth, again in West Cumberland. So the, these sculptures belong to a group, yeah, a little family. Now, this church also belongs to a group, a, a different kind of group. It's a fellowship, if you like, a little federation of parish churches. And these form a, 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 a triangle, if you like. They form a triangle in this part of uh, Cumberland. And the churches in the triangle are made up of Dacre, yeah, Greystoke, and Penrith itself. So these, now what do they have in common, these three? Well, they share their dedication. They're all three of them are dedicated to, uh, to St. Andrew. And it's that, ladies and gentlemen, in this period when we do have a serious lack of documentation. So, you know, historians of the, of the Dark Ages have to be pretty inventive uh, uh, people, but you know, we can do a little bit of dating here uh, because we have a figure coming on to a stage. This is St. Wilfrid, okay? St. Wilfrid was Bishop of Hexham, okay, on the Tyne, as you know. Now, St. Wilfrid, Bishop of Hexham, adopted St. Andrew, yeah, as his patron saint. And he dedicated Hexham Priory to St. Andrew in 674. And this dedication to St. Andrew, St. Wilfrid's patron saint, was followed up in the other group of St. Andrew churches, yeah? Uh, that is to say, the ones I've enumerated, Dacre, Greystoke, uh, and Penrith. Now, uh, let's, let's put the final sort of um, touch to that, because Bishop Wilfred's dates are 634, yeah, to either 79 or 710. So, if the Cumberland namings fell within uh, uh, St. Wilfred's lifetime, then we can put a date to the inception of this church within the lifetime of, uh, of, of St. Wilfred, which means the late 7th century, the late 600s, if you like, or the early uh, 8th century. So what do we have then? You know, we have more than a millennium here. We have a mil millennium plus. We have a long millennium going back to about the 7th or 8th century for the foundation of this church of St. Andrew, uh, which takes its name from Bishop Wilfred's um, uh, 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 adoption of, of, of Andrew. Now, we, we've got some clues there, but you know, the, the, we're still in the Dark Ages, and they're called the Dark Ages because we see the period through a glass darkly. That's the problem of those pre-literate uh, centuries. So we are at a bit of a loss for a chronology beyond a possible foundation date of 7th or 8th uh, century. So we have to leap forward quite a bit, actually. We have to jump over some centuries until we can come to the point of the presentation of this church by King Henry I. Now we have a date, because he gave this church, donated this church to the new diocese that he founded in 1150. 33. So at last, you know, we have another date. We have the date of the foundation of the old church, and now we have, and of course that means that this is very much a royal property. This is a royal gift to the diocese of uh, Carlisle. So there was a church here. What was it like? What was the Norman church uh, like? Well, it was probably built in what's known as the Romanesque style on the continent, the Norman style, rounded arches and so on and so forth. And at some point, ladies and gentlemen, it was replaced by another church in what's known as the Early English uh, style or the, uh, um, the Gothic um, style. That was an architectural style rather than round arches, uh, pointed arches. And they say that those are the pointed arches that the Crusaders brought back from the Middle East. Uh, so there's a distinctive feature. This would have been a Gothic church to use that architectural uh, term. And a foundation date well, certainly 13th century. I'm going to offer 12, between 1236 and 1295, very much. It's, the, it's within the, it costs money to build churches, and this is a prosperous era in Europe, in Britain, and in Penrith. It is the era in which um, Penrith received its market, its weekly market uh, from the crown in 1223. So there was money around in the 13th century. Uh, and the Gothic church, probably the second 
uh, church, replacing what would have been, or possibly it was the third. There may have been a Saxon church, then a Norman church, but, and then eventually the, 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 the Gothic church of the 13th century in the early English style. Remember the pointed. Let's um, conjecture about the size of that church, uh, uh, shall we? And to do that, I'm going to put it to you that it was the same size as this building in terms of length and breadth, yeah? That this, this building occupied the same space, which means it's a very large building indeed, yeah? For, for a parish uh, a church, a massive structure, I'm going to call it, um, probably about the same size as Greystoke, if, if we visited Greystoke, probably in that order of uh, magnitude. And that means then that it was fitted by its size, you know, to accommodate a lot of people, that it was fitted for its role as what Angus Winchester calls, quote, a parochial center from the medieval period onwards. So it's a great big uh, parochial church, a minster, you might call it in other parts uh, of the country. Another way of calculating, another sort of calculus really, uh, to uh, ascertain, to calculate the size of the 13th century building would be to say, well, look at the size of the tower, okay? Look at the size of the tower. Now, that's a great, hefty, huge tower. And if it were a little church, it would be completely out of proportion. The church would have been out of... So let's use the size of the tower, the great mass of the tower, let's use it as a conjectural way of estimating the size of the, of the building, because otherwise you would have a lack of... Uh, uh, proportion, and we do have we we, we do have um, some some clues uh, as to what the medieval church uh, would have um, looked like. A character who's going to figure quite a bit in uh, this talk this afternoon is the vicar, Hugh Todd. He his life dates are 1658 to 1728. He was appointed to this ministry in 16. 99, and as we'll see a little later, uh, he was the guiding spirit. He was the inspiration behind the 1722 uh, construction. A remarkable character in any way. But we're also indebted to him for a description of the church, the medieval church that survived the, the reformation of the, uh, of the 16th century. So he does give us a little bit of a, uh, a photograph uh, of it, as do two historians, two great Cumbrian historians, Nicholson and Byrne, the great historians of Cumberland and Westmoreland. And, and from these sources, we can gain, again, an unmistakable impression of an edifice of overpowering size. So we have a ways of uh, estimating the size. One is to say, look, it's the same size as this. It's the same girth. It's the same length. It's the same breadth. Uh, as this church. Also, we can say, well, look, if, the, uh, if it was a small church, that tower w w would have been grotesque. So the, the, the size of the tower gives us a way of calculating what, what would have been the church. And we also have, um, uh, as I say, an image from, from the vicar, Hugh Todd. He says, uh, it was in a line uh, with the grand, he calls it the grand old tower into which it opened through a massive arch. So everything is spanning the east side of the tower. The nave terminating eastward with a chancel known as St. Mary's. There were two chancels. Uh, that, that was, uh, St. Mary's was the bishop's choir. He was the patron. Um, and that contained the main altar, the mass altar, if you like. And then there was a southern um, uh, uh, choir that was dedicated to St. Andrew. So we have these two altars, uh, if you like. I mentioned the Mass, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and that reminds us of an obvious fact, that worship in the medieval uh, church was that of the international Catholic Church that was based on uh, Papal Rome. And in that variant of Christianity, the cult of the saints was uppermost. So the main aisle uh, was consecrated to the Queen of Heaven, the Blessed Virgin Mary. It was the Mary uh, Choir. And the town itself, of course, took its identity, its common seal, from the Saltire Cross of St. Andrew. So we have these two uh, key saints. Now there's a further feature of medieval Catholic 
piety in the church. So it's the medieval church, it's a Catholic church, yeah? And that's something called a chantry chapel. What is a chantry chapel, my friends? Well, it's a chapel in which a priest was to sing. And the Latin verb is cantare, so it breaks down into medieval English as chantry, chantry or chantry, if you like, from cantare. So the priest then is there, he's a, he's a, a chantrist, and his job, and I mean his job, is to sing masses, yeah? Uh, to sing masses, um, daily masses, uh, for the release of the founder's soul from the torments of purgatory, the purifying torments of purgatory after the donor's death. The donor is Bishop Strickland of Carlisle, and he left money, he left land, to pay for a gentrice. That would be a young a priest, newly ordained uh, priest, on the bottom rungs of the clerical promotional ladder. And he would be paid the reasonable sum. He's starting off in clerical life. He's starting off in priestly life. Uh, and he would have been paid six pounds a year out of Bishop Strickland, Strickland's. Um, it would be, in modern terms, if we multiplied by a thousand, we're usually on safe, on safe side, uh, about 6,000 a year, not very much, but uh, he would also be teaching school. He would be teaching at the free school, the grammar school that Bishop Strickland also um, founded. Uh, founders of these chantries um, were worried that the chantrist uh, would sing his mass at eight or nine in the morning uh, and then take off to the alehouse and play dice all day. So what they decided to do was give them something useful to do. And there are a few things more useful to do than to teach. So having sung his mass, off he goes to, uh, to teach the, the school over there. Yeah? Everything within this. Now, the evidence is that these Catholic ways, you know, the mass, the saints, um, the chantry, were popular with medieval uh, Penrithians, though in a rather complex and selective way. Let me explain. They often resented the sometimes overbearing authority and the financial demands of the bishops of Carlisle. The, the, the diocese of Carlisle was notoriously badly funded from the time of its, so, and that made the, that made the, uh, the bishops of Carlisle very avaricious uh, uh, men. And uh, Penrithians resented the demands, the financial demands of those uh, bishops. So there were a number of uh, unseemly assaults uh, on Episcopal authority in, the, in that troubled 14th century, that very disturbed era of war and plague and pestilence. Um, and the, uh, these attacks on the bishop, or the bishop's men, included a physical attack in 1377 on Bishop de Kirby himself uh, and his officers. And in 1340, even more seriously, even more seriously, the churchyard had to be cleansed, ritually cleansed with holy water and so on and so forth, uh, to be cleansed from pollution by bloodshed. So there was a, uh, it, it was made unholy and it had to be sanctified uh, again. However, on the other side of the equation, in 1291, a new convent, a new friary, was opened here in Penrith, in, in Friargate. Uh, across the way. Uh, this was one of the, there, 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 were, there were several orders of friars, preaching friars in the Middle Ages, founded mostly uh, in Italy and spreading out across Europe, making their, um, putting their roots down in towns, in the growing towns of the 12th and 13th centuries. There was a fear that the new towns of that period, especially in Italy, would become dechristianized. And so what the friars are doing, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, and others, were filling the gap, preaching uh, to, the, uh, to the people. Um, and they were popular uh, in Penrith. They were, as unpo they were as, as popular, because they espoused what was known as holy poverty, voluntary poverty. They were as popular as the avaricious bishops were hated, so much so. And Penrithians and other Cumbrians, what were they doing? was making small gifts of cash. You see, it was, f it, it was futile to make a huge grant of real estate to these men who avowed to holy poverty. So they're not monks, 
They're friars. And so what, what, they are given allowances, small allowances, voluntary allowances, small gifts of food to tide them over yeah? uh, uh, through the cost of living crisis uh, of, the, of, the, of the period. And uh, those gifts show the affection of Cumbrians for the, for the brothers. And e even the bishops saw that popularity. Even the bishops saw that affection, that love of Cumbrians and uh, Penrithians. Because in 1360, Bishop of Carlisle, Bishop de Welton, he issued an indulgence. An indulgence is a remission of penitential uh, practices. And he offered this remission. Quote, to all in the diocese who go to the conventual church, that was the chapel of the friary in Friargate, to all in the diocese who go to the conventual church in a contrite and penitent spirit for the purpose of hearing mass on Christmas Day, or who contribute of their goods for the keeping of the said candles. That's the, to say there, they're expensive candles, they're expensive wax candles burned in the chapel uh, on that day, on Christmas Day, in honor of the day and in honor of Christ's mother, Mary. So there is a popularity of, of, of Catholic ways, but it's complex and it's mixed and it could be contradictory. Dislike of the, uh, of, of the, of, of the bishops, great affection for the, uh, for the preaching friars, the Augustinian friars. And I think that affection for that aspect of medieval Catholicism explains something. And what it explains is the resistance, the militant, uh, or military if you like, the militant resistance of Cumbrians in general and of Penrithians in particular to Henry VIII's enforced closure or dissolution, to use the euphemism, of the monasteries, the friaries, and the nunneries. That was a process, that dissolution of the monasteries began in earnest in 1536. And something else began in earnest in 1536, a revolt against the closure of the friaries and the monasteries, a revolt known as a pilgrimage, the pilgrimage of grace. And this place, this town, was the command center of that rebellion. It was the most serious of the several uh, revolts that the Tudor dynasty faced in the, in the course of the uh, 16th century, it could even have resulted in the detachment of the North uh, from, Tudor, uh, from uh, Tudor England. It was, uh, it was crushed, uh, ruthlessly crushed, and it was followed by reprisals, harsh reprisals, around Cumberland and Westmoreland, including eight hangings of rebels that took place in Penrith. And Penrith was described by the royal commander, the Duke of Norfolk, has, quote, the worst town in the entire county at the last rebellion. That was his retrospective uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the behavior of Penrithians. Please excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. It's still on the sultry side, isn't it? Um, the worst town in the entire county at the last rebellion. And yet, that uh, intimidation did not succeed in crushing Catholic tradition because Catholic tradition lingered in gentry families of this uh, neighborhood and gave rise, the survival of Catholicism gave rise, for example, to the execution in 1594 of a Catholic priest, John Bost. He was of Dufton and Penrith parentage. Pardon me again, please. So we've got the survival of Catholicism um, beyond, the, beyond the Reformation, beyond the Reformation that was introduced by Henry VIII uh, in the 1540s, the Reformation that was uh, accelerated by Henry VIII's son Edward VI between 1547 and 1553, and the third phase of the Reformation under Elizabeth between 1558 and 1603. Now, during those Reformations, because we're looking at three Reformations, Something should have happened to the interior of this church. It should have been stripped by, uh, as a result of iconoclasm, it should have been stripped of its images of Mary, of St. Andrew, and whichever uh, saints you like. We don't know whether or not uh, it was. It ought to have been. 
But you see, ladies and gentlemen, there's another complexity here, you see. There, there's more contradictoriness in religious history. There are more waves and counter waves, yeah? Um, because what we've got, okay, Elizabeth came to the throne in 1558. The Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, yeah, was uh, legislated by Parliament in the Act of Uniformity of 1559. So that laid the foundation for a Protestant Reformation. And we know several things about Tudor Protestantism, European Protestantism, the, the belief, for example, in justification by faith alone without the works of the law, crucial, the denial of the saints, and the denial of what was seen as the blasphemous doctrine of purgatory, okay? Was the, purgatory was the doctrinal basis for Bishop Strickland's establishment of a chantry here, okay? So we've got the Reformation, legislated in 1559, yeah? So how do we explain a subsequent contradiction, okay? Because that's a tomb that was here in 1562. That's three, four years after the accession of Queen Elizabeth, follows the legislation of the, uh, of, of the Elizabethan Parliament, yeah? So how do we explain this? A, a monument, a tomb uh, of a gentleman, a member of the gentry, if you like, from the village of Plumpton, which was in this uh, parish. And we have this memorial, and it reads, well, it's in Latin, so let's do it, pray for the soul. Well, that is so completely, you see, we are justified by faith alone, yeah? We're judged by faith alone. There is no purgatory. What's the point of praying for people after they've died? Judgments, the, the decisions have already been made. What's the point? There is no purgatory. Martin Luther denied the existence of purgatory. And yet, here in this church in 1562, we have this uh, more than relic, yeah? We have this retention of a Catholic cultus, yeah? Pray for the soul of Richard Coldale, on whose soul God may have mercy. So we've got a Catholic economy there, ladies and gentlemen. We've got a Catholic system. That is to say that Catholics believed, yeah, that at death not all the decisions were made. One could continue to pay for friends, relations, and benefactors. Those are the terms I was taught in my Catholic school in Cardiff. Friends, relations, and benefactors. You can still pray for them. The, 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 the the decisions are not all made. You can pray for the souls of the faithful departed. That's what a chantry uh, is, is, is for. And here in 1562, I say as late as 1562, we have that uh, message, that or invitation. It's almost a command. Orate, pray for the soul of Richard Calder, on whose soul may God have mercy. It's an invocation of the doctrine of purgatory coming from the Protestant reign of Queen Elizabeth. And it's the kind of thing that would have not phased Bishop Strickland at all. You know? It's exactly the same doctrinal theme that, on the basis of which Strickland built his Chantry Chapel, pray for the soul. That's what a Chantry is. And yes, you see, this is where things get so complicated because there is Catholic retention. Some of the gentry in the area retain their Catholic beliefs. Uh, and yet the green shoots of Protestantism were visible in Elizabeth's reign. What the, uh, what the church needed was, I think, a long period of settlement in the ministry, in the pastorate of the church. And um, Penrith was fortunate in getting a, a long uh, vicariate, a man named William Wallace, W-A-L-L-E-I-S. He was vicar for a, lot, for a generation from 1575 to 1601. And that's a key generation, you see. Yeah? That is a perfect 25-year generation. Why is it so significant? Well, it means that during his vicariat, a whole generation has grown up, yeah? been christened, been wed. Some of them will have buried their parents with no other liturgy but that of the Book of Common Prayer and administration of the sacraments of the Church of England. So this is the first generation, really, ladies and gentlemen, that knew nothing but, uh, but, but Reformation 
uh, Protestantism. And that's the importance of this long pastorate of William uh, Wallace, because he was able then, the Reformation didn't come about easily. There had to be momentum behind it, and the momentum took the form of preaching yeah, in the pulpit of this, uh, of this church. There was another uh, uh, key marker of progress in the direction of Protestantism, and that was the refoundation. This took place in 1564 of Strickland's school, which is, had been linked to the chantry. Uh, it was converted into a royal foundation, not an Episcopal uh, foundation. And it was remarkable in that it brought together two themes that we sometimes think were, um, uh, were not uh, consistent. That is to say, the Protestant doctrines of the English Reformation and something else coming from continental Europe, a literary culture, a humanist culture, the culture of the European classical Renaissance. And the grammar school brought those two things uh, together, as happened in the case of the poet Edmund Spencer or, or, or Philip Sidney. The two things brought together Renaissance classical culture, Latin and Greek, and Christian doctrine. And, and there was another factor in the, in the Protestant takeoff under uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth, and that was the recruitment to the Church of England of leading town gentry. One of them was uh, one John Whelpdale of uh, Dockery Hall. And of course, he's gone back now to being Dockery Hall. It was after many years of the, um, what was it called before it was Dockery Hall? Gloucester Arms. It's Dockery Hall again now. That was, that was John Whelpdale's uh, home. And he was appointed a governor of uh, the grammar school. And the gentry were so important in Tudor England that where they led, the common people tended to follow. So these men were, what do they call them these days, influencers. Yeah? And another one was a remarkable character, Gerard Lowther, of the same family, of Newhall, uh, that was, which was later to become another pub, the Two Lions Tavern. And that's off, uh, that, that's off Great Dockery again. Um, Gerard uh, Lowther was an opportunist. He started off uh, as a, a rebel against Queen Elizabeth in what was called the Revolt of the Northern Earls, a Catholic rising in 1569, but uh, he saw sense, did Gerard um, uh, Lowther, and after the failure of the revolt of the Northern Earls, uh, he converted to become one of Queen Elizabeth's most loyal supporters uh, and lawyers. Welpdale died, John Welpdale died in 1596, and Lowther in the following year, and they would have been arch rivals, these two, living across the square from each other. And they died on the brink of the town's worst ever demographic disaster, the Great Plague of 1597 to 1599. And over those terrible months, over those tragic months, William Wallace meticulously, dutifully, recorded a catastrophic 615 Penrith deaths as a result of the epidemic. It was a, a final, not final, but it was a late um, uh, uh, eruption of the Black Death, bubonic plague. Uh, tragically, William Wallace had to record in his enumeration of 615 deaths those of his wife and only son. And St. Andrews now became, over those terrible months, St. Andrews became the place of community anguish, with a seemingly endless procession of funerals carried out according to the order of burials of the Book of Common Prayer uh, of the Church of England. Its churchyard, its churchyard here, was turned into a vast reservoir of mortality, but to be supplemented, because when it got full, when the graveyard got full, it was supplemented by um, a, an emergency graveyard. Uh, at the junction of Croft Terrace and Wordsworth Street. Well, amidst all the troubles of the following century, England's worst century, um, the century of revolution, the 17th century, the Stuart century, Penrith in general, and this church in particular, were taken up, they were embraced in a great movement, England's second reformation, England's second Protestant reformation. This was a movement, this is the Puritan movement, 
that was dedicated to a transformation of the English into a new people, yeah? A makeover, a makeover in the national character, yeah? In which the English would be broken on the wheel and turned into something else. Turned into what? Well, turned into a new Israel, yeah? Turned into a godly uh, people. The process known at the time as godly rule. Yeah? Godly because it was dedicated to God and rule because it would, had to be imposed by discipline. A discipline, ladies and gentlemen. So in 1656, an agreement was forged by the Puritan Calvinist ministers of Cumberland and Westmoreland. And they decreed an endless list of sanctions, disciplinary sanctions, against all those who, on Sundays, because you see, just as the people of Israel made their covenant with the Almighty by keeping the Sabbath holy, so the English would be a covenanted people, a new Israel, a second Israel, by making Sunday a holy day, yeah? in which most activities apart from prayer, preaching, and worship were proscribed. So this is the list of what the Puritan ministers um, denounced. Sanctions, that is to say, for all those who on that holy day danced, uh, played dice, played cards, uh, played football, um, uh, did Cumberland West, uh, wrestling, yeah? uh, all those who held drinking parties, whether or not they were in houses named number 10, it doesn't say. Uh, sanctions against all, everyone who went shooting, or fencing, or took part in bear baiting, or bull baiting, or hunting, or hair coursing, or fishing, or fowling, or went to plays, the plays were banned uh, anyway. And you see, rank was no, a person's rank was no uh, guarantee, was no barrier against this godly discipline. Because a leading Civil War royalist of the area, another Welpdale, this time William Welpdale, he found that, that there was no let off when he was fined a shilling, significant sum, days, about 80 quid, um, for swearing. And the magistrate in question, because this was a social as well as a religious revolution, yeah? In which new men, yeah, merchants, were coming to the fore, supplanting the landed gentry. And here's a case in point, uh, because the magistrate who fined uh, Mr. Welpdale was a merchant, a clothier, a, me a mere merchant. And Welpdale would have been absolutely furious at the social insolence of this upstart finding him. Welpdale uh, being a, a royalist and an Anglican and a member of the gentry, and, his, and the magistrate, uh, Thomas Langhorne, a, a pioneer of the Puritan Presbyterian congregation uh, in Penrith. Now, all the main forms of Protestantism that stemmed from that 16th century English Reformation stress something. They stress the centrality of preaching as the foremost ecclesiastical and clerical activity designed for doctrinal and moral instruction. And of no group was this stress on preaching more true than of the various groups that we lumped together as Puritans. After the Puritan-inspired Parliament's victory in the civil wars, of 1642 to 1651, Penrith St. Andrews was uh, assigned a Puritan, Puritan ministry. One of these clerics, one of these Puritan uh, clerics, was Roger Baldwin, and he was appointed lecturer in 1649, but it's very interesting, very significant, to see what his tasks were to be, to preach. That's my effort, to preach. That's his job. Not to administer sacrament, to preach in the said parish church. And he was paid a very substantial sum of money, 108 pounds uh, a year, to be, quote, a good scriptural preacher. The problem with, though, with the surviving pre-Reformation parish church is that it didn't work even, it didn't work even as a preaching box, do you see? 
It was supposed to be, because it was designed as a temple for celebrating mass. It wasn't designed as a lecture theater for preaching and listening. Uh, you know, there were some sort of observers who were a bit on the lazy side, and they would say, oh, it's very fair, it's a beautiful edifice, it's a, a fair church. But even as a hall for hearing homilies, homilies, Old St. Andrews was defective. It was, quote, basely seated. That's to say, it, wasn't, it was poorly provided with seating. The pews have been neglected. The merchant's pew drowns the preacher's voice. You can see the emphasis. You can see the priority there. It's all about hearing the preacher's voice, isn't it? The, 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 the old church was faulty because it, wasn't, it didn't work as a preaching chamber. It didn't work as an auditorium. Further, the vicar who oversaw the great replacement, Hugh Todd, he had dallied with Roman Catholicism while he was at Oxford. And he settled down after that episode, he settled down as an Anglican churchman, an Anglican churchman, but of the high church variety, the ritualist Anglicanism, the sacramentarian party, reverencing the Eucharist, the Holy Communion, as well as the Word. So Todd then was looking for two things. He was happy, he wanted to see the, uh, the, the, the church operating as a place of instruction, yeah, where the Word was preached, yeah, but he also wanted to see it as once more a place of sacramental worship. So it had to do two things. It had to be visible and audible in the new construction. And Todd's critique of the old building was not only that the old structure obstructed the hearing of the preacher's delivery, but you could not see the liturgy. You could not see the consecration of the elements in, in Holy Communion. So it was a building that really had to go. It was a failure of a building. It hadn't been adapted or adopted to the needs of the Reformation in any way, neither to the preaching of God's Word nor to the administration of the sacraments of the Church of England, the Book of uh, Common Prayer. That merchant's pew, it, 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 it drove Hugh Todd crackers. That merchant's pew was one of those features of the old St. Andrews that represented a, an, an excess of privatization within the of property claims within the interior. For example, the powerful Hutton family uh, insisted on their ownership of what had been Bishop Strickland's Chantry Chapel in the St. Andrews uh, choir. So there was this privatization going on. It wasn't even working as a proper congregational uh, church. There were too many vested interests. There were too many private chambers, too many private pews. It wasn't a proper congregational edifice. There was also a, a, a danger, an absence of health and safety. There was neglect. There was appalling improvisation. There was chronic disrepair. There was even a report in 1717 to the effect that the appropriator, even the appropriator, the patron of the benefits, the Bishop of Carlisle, had actually allowed the Central St. Mary's Choir to fall into decay and is ready to fall. The main beam stands upon a prop and one arch gives way from the parochial part of the church on which this chancel has no dependence. And there was a long series of burials in the floor of the, uh, of the church. Uh, so, because the local gentry had been turning the place into a kind of huge enclosed cemetery. There were also, this, 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 this building, the medieval building, was under a sentence, ladies and gentlemen. It was under a, a, a mortality sentence. There were even, there were also uh, aesthetic grounds of objection to the old structure. It was built in the medieval style, which went right out of fashion in the 18th, uh, 18th century in, in, in Britain and the rest of Europe. Gothic, the original term, meant barbaric. It meant irregular. It meant asymmetrical. It defied the Palladian canons of Georgian classical architecture, the principles of balance, of simplicity, of regularity, of symmetry. It was condemned uh, as, quote, rude, that's to say coarse, uh, unequal, that is to say not symmetrical being built at different times, uh, uh, rather than according to a single architectural plan. It was rude, it was unequal, being built at different times. There's no uniformity, said Todd. There's no uniformity in the whole. Regrettably shapeless, 
with accretions of various dates. There was no blueprint for it. It had been put together over the course of the generations, bit by bit, each generation adding a little bit. Todd wanted a, a, a blueprint, yeah? a, 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 a coherent plan. It, it's very, he said, it's very ancient, irregular, a very ancient, irregular, uh, deformed building. So there were, there were two options, you know, confronting uh, the, uh, the great and the good, yeah? And one of them, survival, patching, matching and mending, was discounted. This church is being condemned, the medieval church. Now, there was another option that was taken up by other churches around uh, the country, um, but it was Hugh Todd who vigorously led and directed the case for A, demolition, and B, replacement. So after a tumultuous quarrel in 1707 with the Bishop of Carlisle, William Nicholson, Todd began the program of destruction and reconstruction. In 1709, he gave notice of a plan that, quote, a convenient place may be built for parish worship, followed in 1716 by the appointment of trustees who submitted something that Todd wanted, a plan, yeah? an architect's plan for a new church and a petition for what was called a brief, which was a, a kind of begging letter that went round um, uh, the country. Uh, this, this Ben Reith, it, it was expected to raise 1,380 pounds. It took four years to collect, and it produced, guess what, 344 pounds, 600 pounds having been lost in overheads, in administrative uh, overheads. So in, in the end, it was quite clear that a national appeal would not work, uh, that the money would have to come from Cumbrians and would have to come from Penrithians. And donations came from within the county, brought in uh, a handsome sum from Sir Wilfred Lawson of faraway Isle near Cockermouth. Another 100 pounds came from Dr. Addison Hutton uh, of that dynasty. Uh, uh, Sir Christopher Musgrave of Eden Hall kicked in 50 pounds, and there were smaller gifts of 20 pounds, seven pounds, a guinea. There was even 71 pounds uh, from the old masonry uh, of the church. Nicholson's, uh, Bishop Nicholson's successor at Carlisle, Bishop Bradford, he contributed 20 pounds. Uh, but Nicholson wasn't to be outdone. He sent 21 pounds, you see. But the, the bulk, of the, apart from those personal donations, the bulk of the money came from a compulsory church rate that was levied on 400 named householders, the better off of Penrith. Um, and it was Penrithian, ladies and gentlemen, your forebears, I guess, who paid uh, for this church. As with the deconstruction, reconstruction, uh, there was no movement away from a Georgian, a Georgian classical, a Palladian uh, mode. And the commission was entrusted to a leading northern architectural classicist, William Etty, E-double-T-Y, of York. And then in the background, there was something else. There, that was the extraordinary success of a team of modernizing architects led by Sir Christopher Wren in giving London, in giving the capital, uh, following the great fire of 1666, a whole generation of new churches built in the Palladian classical uh, style. In fact, they were churches, the London churches harmonized classicism in architecture with Christianity. They were great preaching auditoria. St. Paul's is a great preaching uh, auditoria. And the trustees for this building singled out the example of, um, uh, of, of St. Paul's. There are a couple of uh, exceptions to the classical rule. First of all, uh, unlike St. Paul's, uh, there was no cupola or dome for whatever reason. Secondly, and perhaps oddly, uh, given the disparagement of Gothic architecture in the preliminary discussions, the medieval tower was retained. Um, not to everyone's satisfaction, uh, on a visit to Penrith in 1774, uh, a rather snooty classicist, Henry Hobhouse, bemoaned a new church built, a handsome modern building. He liked it, it was classical. Yeah? A handsome modern building, and jo but joined to an old tower. 
which disgraces it. So why was the tower retained? Why was this medieval Gothic tower retained? Well, um, we can only guess. Uh, for one thing, its six-foot walls would have deterred most demolition teams. But there's another possibility, and that's uh, it's an aesthetic one. I think it's a cultural one. The square tower of our medieval church is a very English uh, distinctive feature. Um, and, you know, for example, down in Lancaster, where we lived for many years, the Priory Church acquired a new medieval style tower at the height of the classical revival in Britain, 1754. And of course, in this area, we've got those um, defensive structures uh, of, of square towers Great Solkeld, Lowther, Appleby, Brough by Sands. So, uh, this, the tower, the retention of the tower, may be a kind of tribute. Uh, to the sandstone towers of the area. Well, the consecration service took place uh, on the 17th of March. It was presided over by Nicholson. He was paying a return visit to Cumberland from his new diocese of Derry uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, but although Nicholson was there, the liturgy for the opening service conformed with Todd's high church uh, ideals. For example, Psalm 24 was repeated, quote, alternately at several stations as they advanced to the altar. It's a very high church term. Uh, yeah, it, it's a Eucharistic term. Um, the psalm was repeated at several stations as they advanced to the altar, assisted with the good appearance of the clergy and a suitable appearance of a full house. Well, what the full house saw um, and it was described in 17, 1897 as, quote, a spacious edifice. Yeah? Uh, uh, as they say of St. Paul's in London, si monumentum requiris circumspice, if you want a monument, just look around you. And this is what the, um, the, the Victorian visitors saw, a spacious edifice of red sandstone in the classic style, consisting of chancel, nave, Isles, vestry, and an embattled, he calls it, an embattled western tower. Um, crenellation, they, crenellations are the things that go up and down on a tower. What are they called? Anyway, they're, they're those, embattled. Yeah. The interior, the observer said, is surrounded on three sides by galleries. And the galleries were necessary because Penrith's population was increasing. It's a prosperous period for Penrith, so the galleries had to, as it were, accommodate the overspill from uh, the ground floor. The interior is surrounded on three sides by galleries supported by 19 uh, monolithic columns of Crowdundale, that's over in Temple Sarbi, Crowdundale marble of the Ionic. There are three orders of Greek architecture and the Ionic is the most austere. So, uh, for example, if we, in the Methodist church in Penrith, they use the third of the uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the Greek architectural um, styles. That's the Corinthian, which is very florid, has lots of floral decoration. This is the I Ionian or Ionic, and you can see how simple and austere uh, it is, yeah? uh, the austere Grecian. It was a pioneer structure, yeah? um, as Pevsner and Hyde uh, write. It was the stateliest yeah? and the earliest. I think that's the point the stateliest and the earliest of a crop of Georgian churches in Cumbria. So it was a pace setter. It was a leader of a, a generation. For example, there's a lovely one in, in Whitehaven. If you, it's, it's now reopened to the public. St. George, St. James's in Whitehaven dates from 1752. But this is the exemplar for those. Well, art, artistic tastes, friends alter over time. Hobhouse and the classicist deplored the retention of the Gothic Tower. And now it was the turn of the Victorian romantic medievalists to pour scorn on this church that they thought was not Christian. Yeah? It was Grecian. It was pagan. The architecture is that of a pagan temple, not of a Christian church. Yeah? It was a whole sort of um, school of thought led by the Catholic uh, architect uh, Pugin, who decried classical architecture. Pugin even hated St. Peter's in Rome because it was non-Christian. Yeah. 
the architect who was pre-Christian. And so in the 19th century, the Victorians didn't like this at all. You know? They wanted uh, the Gothic Revival architect. Meanwhile, though, this lovely church has continued and continues to act as its town's chronicler. From those candelabra, ladies and gentlemen, there they are. Can you see the candelabra suspended? They were gifted um, by the Duke of Portland as a, a reward to commemorate the brave resistance of the locals to the Jacobite invasion of 1745. We have a restoration that took place in, please excuse me, in 1863. We have Jacob Thompson masterpieces, Victorian masterpieces. We have the parish rooms of 1895, which were used as um, a military hospital in the Great War. We have a chapel of remembrance in, of 1951. We have the Rotary Garden of 1971. And we have the situation today, ladies and gentlemen, in which, amidst what's sometimes called de-Christianization, St. Andrews enshrines Christ at the center of Penrith. My voice as you gather is giving up, ladies and gentlemen, so I'll take a seat for a moment, if you'll excuse me, and a drink of water. Thank you very much for, for that, David. Thank you. Thank you. I made the mistake. I made the mistake of having a delicious dish of freezing cold ice cream. Oh. Anyone fancy freezing cold ice cream? <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Is there I mean, an opportunity for uh, yes, please, if I questions? Can. Yes, is, yes. Uh, or the, the, gosh, is, how do you respond when we, we've heard so much? It's, uh, it's like having a, a fifteen-course banquet and saying, which which bit would you like to try again? I'll um, take a seat while you're. Yeah, pre yeah. But, um, if, if there are some questions, um, I, I'll repeat the question here so that it's picked up on the live stream and then Professor Mullet can respond to it. Um, or, or you might prefer to have a cup of tea and a biscuit and just to chat, ch chat in, informally together. But are there any questions that anyone would like to ask? You floored us. Yeah? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'll just repeat the question so that it's captured for anyone who's watching us or catching up later. So the question was, Professor Mullet referred to uh, the dedication to St. Mary, at the, uh, that's earlier stage of the, of the history, and whether the town crosses with the town cross seal, with the St. Andrew's seal, and has the, the fleur-de-lis around it, whether that might be a nod in the direction of Mary. Is that, is that approximately correct? So, thank, you. thank you very yeah, much for that. Um, thank you, David. Um, I, absolutely. Um, you, the, the, obviously, the main uh, feature, and, and it dominates the seal, is the, the old rugged cross, as I sometimes call it, the Saltire Cross of St. Andrew, because of the, of the manner of his uh, crucifixion. But you're absolutely right. There are flanges which show the, the fleur de lis, the, uh, the, the emblem of France, and that, of course, the fleur de lis. Uh, is the representation of Mary's purity. So there, there is a Marian uh, theme in the, um, in, in the cross. It was found, uh, I th fairly accidentally, I think, the, the Saltire Cross uh, was found in Brampton in the, uh, in the 19th century. And it was probably dropped by one of those eternally raiders coming from the other side of the, 
uh, of the boy. He would have pinched it because, you know, they, 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 they nicked everything that wasn't nailed down and lots of things that weren't. Um, and he would have dropped it, I think, on his retreat. It's a lovely thought that Scotland adopted. We didn't, Penrith didn't adopt the Sultar from Scotland, but Scotland adopted the Sultar from Penrith. It's, uh, but um, it was then the person who, uh, it came into the hands of one of the MPs for, um, uh, for Carlisle, who then presented it to the governing body in the 19th century, the Urban District Council, and they adopted it as their motif. And then in the 1950s, it was replaced for a period by a rather trumpery um, uh, coat of arms uh, with all kinds of, uh, a busy little thing really with a sort of castle and a wheat sheaf and so on. That didn't last very long. And in recent years, we've seen the real comeback of the wonderful Saltire uh, Cross. You see it at the Coronation Gardens, you see it at the school, um, Frenchfield School. You see it all over the place. And it's wonderful to see that the Saltire, the medieval Saltire, has, has really come back as, as Penrith's unique emblem. So thank you for that. Are there any, any other questions? Hello, yeah. No, a scratch. <laughs> any more questions? Well, ladies and gentlemen, there, there is tea and coffee and, and biscuits. Please, please do hang around if you're able to. There's no charge for any of our uh, history talks. If you want to make a donation, it'll just help go to cover a very modest cost. But please do stop around if you're able to, whether you've been here for the hour and are really ready for a stretch or you've just wandered in, in the last few minutes. Um, everybody is welcome. Professor Mullet, thank you so much thank for uh, such an informative, rich and very detailed uh, afternoon's uh, presentation to us. It's been a, a real privilege. Uh, and I've just been sitting at the back thinking, by golly, there's so much more to learn, uh, which is not a bad way to have an afternoon's history presentation. Thank you ever Thank so much. You very much uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for joining us this afternoon, everybody. We can shift some chairs around, so don't feel you've got to stand to have tea and coffee. We can, we can move chairs around and make some informal circles at the back if you'd like to. Thank you very much for being here. So they grew up speaking Penrith, did they? Well, 